Hello everyone. How's everybody doing? I'm not doing too good because I've got a uh, problem with my computers. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure it's my computers. Uh, it could be the line. Something's going on. Um, so if you get a little choppy transmission, yeah, I had no time to investigate what the problem was, but uh, it's happened in the last couple hours. And uh, so um, just so you're warned, that there could be a problem with the transmission. Anyway, just to start off, again, I want to remind everyone that we've got the uh, seventh rational physics conference in Bora, Sweden. Uh, this week, I guess we're going to get the uh, exact address. And uh, another thing I, I at least found out, I think it's been corrected, but I'm not sure, that the um, uh, site in Facebook where we have this uh, advertised, uh, was held as private and so some people apparently had problems signing up and uh, hopefully we correct that um, you know in these uh, these next few days okay um, so what do I want to deal with today well I want to continue with black holes but this time I want to give you the uh, version of the rope hypothesis so I'm going to do a quick um, rundown of what I've covered last week. Hopefully it's quick. <laughs> and, uh, and then I'll proceed with, um, you know, with, the, uh, with my version. Okay? <clears throat> that includes black hole phenomena as well as dark matter phenomena. Okay? okay, one good place to start is what is known as Hawking radiation and uh, as an introduction and what you'll see is that um, you know they, they have this version where particle that's immediately outside the event horizon in other words it's not inside the hole but it's outside the hole right right outside the event horizon um, as you know uh, all particles in uh, uh, mathematical physics uh, have the ability to break in two okay? Uh, okay, I got a message there. Anyways, <clears throat> have the ability to break in two, two pieces, and you have a positive and a negative piece. Okay, and uh, that allows uh, the math magicians to do a lot of magic. You know, whenever you're in a bind, just break the particle in two. Positive particle, negative particle, you're okay. So every particle uh, has zero charge, zero polarity, zero whatever and it can break into positive negative polarity and so on right well what this allows uh, them to do in turn is to say that the black hole swallows one of the two particles okay swallows it in and uh, the other one does not always fall in but is free to fly away okay and thanks to that discovery uh, we can get something out of a black hole or not exactly out of the inside of the black hole but whatever comes to our eyes it's from the surface of the black hole and that's how you can detect the black hole okay you see all this light coming out of uh, the particles that split in two uh, one of the particles always reaches your eyes and so with that they were able to give some work something to do to the astronomers because the astronomers said well if if this thing swallows light what are we supposed to look for with you know with our telescopes I said don't worry well we'll figure it out for you and what they did they figured it out they said look the black hole swallows half a particle or whatever 50 percent i guess and the other particle reaches your eye we want you to detect that particle reaches your eye and that's one way of detecting light from a black hole another one is the way they did it the other day and that's um they went in there and um, looked at the material falling inside a black hole and as it crosses that event horizon well we get all these sparks that come to your eyes uh all these x-rays being created by that you know just crossing that that shadow okay and uh, here is a little bit of uh, illustration of what I just explained. Okay, here's the first one. Uh, this is what uh, Stephen Hawking, that's why it's called Hawking radiation, by the way. It's in honor of Mr. Stephen Hawking, who died, um, what was it now, I think a couple years ago now. 
And he says, you know, that um, at the Big Bang, the universe is thought to have had zero size. And he says there's a big number of particles in the region, okay, and that we can observe. Where do they all come from, he says. And he says the answer is that in quantum theory, particles can be created out of energy in the form of particle-antiparticle pairs. But that just raises the question of where the energy came from. The answer is that the total energy of the universe is exactly zero. The matter in the universe is made out of positive energy, gravitational energy being the uh, negative side, right? So uh, I guess you can say that uh, um, positive energy is male and negative energy is female. I don't know if that's a valid you know, analogy, but I'm, I'm sure they would say something like that in mathematics. They would prove that women are negative, you know? Okay, now twice zero is also zero. Thus, the universe can double the amount of positive energy and also double the negative gravitational energy without violation of the conservation of energy. Okay, so um, this is, this is uh, what he's saying. And uh, so, so now you get an idea where all this um, energy is coming from, you know, uh, that we have in space. In other words, the vacuum itself is made out of something. That something is known as energy. And there is a little process here that we're going to see real quick, uh, which illustrates what uh, Hawking had in mind, and that's how energy becomes particles. Uh, you know, e equals mc squared, well, you know, the energy materializes into something a little more tangible and visible, okay? Okay, and uh, so um, this is what he also says in A Brief History of Time. And it's important to, to listen to this part. It's a little lengthy, but uh, bear with me because uh, you're going to get the idea where he gets all, these, all his ideas. How is it possible that a black hole appears to emit particles when we know that nothing can escape from within its uh, event horizon? Yeah, good question. Um, maybe he can explain how that happens, okay? And he says, uh, the answer quantum theory tells us is that the particles do not come from within the black hole, but from the empty space, empty with quotations, just outside the black hole event horizon. Okay, so you have the black hole, you have the, uh, which is, I guess, the whole thing. You have the singularity at the center. Maybe you have a black ball. Sometimes you don't. You just have the singularity. And you have this region of influence known as the event horizon. Okay, and um, what they're saying is that the, uh, the, this effect that he's going to describe does not occur within the black hole. It occurs just immediately outside the event horizon. Okay, particles that are in space, space which is, under quotations, empty but never really empty. Okay, and he says, what we think of as empty space cannot be completely empty because that would mean that all the fields, such as the gravitational and electromagnetic fields, would have to be exactly zero. However, the value of a field and its rate of change with time are like the position and velocity of a particle um, in quantum mechanics, right? Uh, the uncertainty principle implies that the more accurately one knows one of these quantities, the less accurately one can know the other. So, in empty space, the field cannot be fixed at exactly zero, because then it would have uh, both a precise value, zero, and a precise rate of change, also zero. There must be a certain minimum amount of uncertainty or quantum fluctuations in the value of the field. So this is, what they're, this is where they're getting this from. They're saying that the gravitational and electromagnetic fields, um, you know, are not completely uh, empty, but they are zero. Uh, and, and not, in other words, they cannot be exactly zero, but when they come together, they're going to form uh, a total energy of zero, okay? So it's the individual, the gravitational and electromagnetic fields, which uh, uh, are going to get together and form this, uh, this zero energy, okay? <clears throat> um, 
He says, uh, he continues, one can think of these fluctuations as pairs of particles of light or gravity that appear together at some time, move apart, and then come together again and annihilate each other. Okay? These part, in other words, by annihilation, he doesn't mean they disappear completely, but these particles come together, whatever these particles are, and they form a, uh, a zero energy, a, a nothingness, which is a somethingness. Okay? These particles are virtual particles. Okay? Now we're inventing a little uh, spirit here, like the particles that carry the gravitational force of the sun. So the gravitational force of the sun, now you have it from, from the expert here, is carried by virtual particles, particles that we can't see or detect. Um, they're uh, virtual, I guess uh, by that he means they're not real, whatever real means to him. And that means that he can do anything with, he wants with these spirits. He, he calls them virtual particles. Okay, and he says... Um, Unlike real particles, they cannot be observed directly with a particle detector. However, their indirect effects, such as small changes in the energy of electron orbits in atoms, <clears throat> can be measured and agree with the theoretical predictions to a remarkable degree of accuracy. So they throw in a little um, mathematical stuff there to convince you that uh, they're not real, but they're real. They're going to use them anyways, okay? The uncertainty principle also predicts that there will be similar virtual particles of matter, particles such as electrons or quarks. Okay, so these are the real particles, I guess. In this case, however, one member of the pair will be a particle and the other an antiparticle. And he puts it in parentheses, the antiparticles of light and gravity are the same as the particles. So they're the same. What is the difference between a real particle and a, uh, and a fake particle? See, see what they do? They, they invented this virtual particle, and that's a, really an ad hoc solution to all their problems. Because whenever they need it to plug a hole in the equation, they just say, oh, a virtual particle popped in from the void, right? It used to be energy, now it's mass, right? Did its little thing, and charge. Did its little thing, went back then to its hiding place in, in uh, space. Sounds like a plan, okay? You have the angel, he moves the, the, the curtain, and then he goes back to heaven, okay? And you never see him, you can never touch him, okay? All you can do is see the curtain move, since you can't explain it. You say, well, you know, it's got to be the angel, or the spirit, you know, came, shook the, the curtain, and then left. And that's what these people are saying. They're just introducing this as a uh, variable or as an ad hoc variable. Okay, he continues, and please bear with me with this because it is important. He says, because energy cannot be created out of nothing, one of the partners in a particle-antiparticle pair will have, a, will have positive energy and the other partner negative energy, okay? Uh, the one with negative energy is condemned to be a short-lived virtual particle because real particles always have positive energy in normal situations. It must therefore uh, seek out its partner and annihilate with it. And again, when they use the word annihilate, they don't mean annihilate. What they mean is that it turns into something else. Okay, it doesn't turn into empty space, into nothing. However, a real particle close to a massive body has less energy than if it were far away because it would take energy to lift it far away um, against the gravitational attraction of the body. Okay, in other words, if you're going to have a, uh, if you're going to throw a ball, you're going to need some energy to push it out. In other, right? And if you want to draw it in, you're also going to have to use some energy, whatever your energy is, right? Okay, normally the energy of the particle is still positive, but the gravitational field inside the black hole is so strong that even real particles can have negative, negative energy there. In other words, what you, what he's saying is that. Remember, particles have positive energy, right? At least outside the black hole, outside the event horizon. Uh, the black hole, the gravitational energy uh, contained within a black hole, it has negative energy. But it's so strong that when a particle enters the field uh, of, you know, the, the field of influence of the singularity at the center of the black hole, it, it, the, the negative energy is so, so high that it turns the particle into a negative uh, particle. Okay, so now it's got the particle itself uh, is uh, coated with negative energy. The negative energy, gravitational energy, overcame the positivity of the particle. Okay, it is therefore possible, possible, uh, he proves this, but he calls it possible. 
If a black hole is present for the virtual particle with negative energy to fall into the black hole and become a real particle or antiparticle, right? In this case, it no longer has to annihilate with its partner. It, its forsaken partner may fall into the black hole as well, or having positive energy, it might also escape from the vicinity of the black hole as a real particle or antiparticle. And there you see it on the little drawing on the right. Uh, one of the particle, one of the pairs, you have the, the, the two pairs on top. That's uh, one illustration that he's got. The other one uh, right in the middle there or thereabouts uh, below it says antiparticle escaping into infinity. Its partner fell into the black hole. The antiparticle uh, escaped. Okay. And, uh, and so uh, these are the particles that, we, that the uh, astronomers uh, are able to detect. Okay. Okay, so uh, this is what it looks like. Here you have a little uh, gif uh, of it. You have um, a black hole, singularity with its event horizon, the red um, circle there. Okay, that's the region of influence. You have a particle approaching the event horizon. It's going to break in two. One, the blue one, will fall towards the singularity, and the other, the red one, flies away towards another star, which is that orange one on the upper left. And the question is, why would this, uh, this uh, particle escape the enormous tug of gravity? Remember that the uh, sun pulls on that star and compels it to twirl around. So why would this little particle travel all, you know, travel outwards from the black hole? You would think it also falls towards the singularity. And they're saying, no, that one falls in, the other one leaves, and you are able to see this one. Okay, the first thing you have to understand is this particle is traveling at the speed of light. In other words, this particle is a photon. It's not a particle, a regular particle. It's got to be something that travels at the speed of light. As far as we know, the only one that can travel at the speed of light is the photon itself. Everything else from uh, uh, electrons, protons, muons, pions, all those travel at the snail space compared to, uh, to, the, uh, to light. Okay? So, so what's the issue? The issue is that, um, see if I can uh, illustrate it here. Uh, he says that space is made out of particles, right? And it's made out of positive energy and negative energy. Okay, these two get together, okay, and they form nothing. This is the story that they tell you, okay? So now you have absolutely nothing, which is actually something known as negative energy, or energy is zero. And that empty space essentially is, is uh, made of particles. So it's made of energy, it's made of particles, it's made of energy, it's made of particles. You never know because it's made of both whenever they need whichever one they need. Okay, so what happens? Well, space also has the ability to turn into particles. Okay, so you, you have uh, space, empty space, but space, remember, is full of negative, of, of zero energy. Zero energy breaks into negative and positive energy, and each one of these negative and positive energy separately turn into negative and, po uh, particle, uh, negative and positive particles. Okay, so that's, that's how... Uh, E equals mc squared uh, works in their minds. They, they turn the energy into particles, okay? And those are the particles that one of them is going to fall into the uh, black hole. But again, the question is, why would one of them leave if, um, you know, it would have to travel at the speed of light, okay? Uh, so if inside the black hole, inside the event horizon, you have a speed of 300,000 kilometers per second, which is what they claim is the speed within the black hole and no faster, no faster, no slower, okay? From the event horizon all the way to the singularity, 300,000 kilometers per second. Okay, that's one particle is going to be sucked in there at that velocity. It's going to travel in there or fall in there, whichever way you want to visualize that. The other particle is escaping the event horizon. Why? Because it's outside the event horizon, it's not at 300,000 kilometers anymore per second. Now it's at 299 or 298 or 297. The particle has to travel faster than that speed. That means it's got to be a photon. Photon travels at 300,000, and the pull of gravity of the singularity is 299 outside of the event horizon. 
Well, then the, the particle is a little faster than the pull of gravity at that point, and that's why they claim it, it can escape. Okay? Let's see if I, I see it one more time. Okay? Between the singularity and the event horizon, you have 300,000 kilometers per second, the speed of light. That's, according to them, the speed of gravity. Okay? So gravity and light have the same speeds. Okay, so one particle falls in falls in and it goes towards the center of the singularity at 300,000 kilometers per second. It's got to be a photon because the particle, the other particle, the one that left, the one that was able to, to exit, in other words, that was not swallowed or did not fall into the black hole, the reason it can escape is it has to be traveling at 300,000 kilometers per second in a region where the speed limit is 299 or 298 or 297. In other words, it's outside the event horizon and the speed there is a little slower than light. Okay, the speed of gravity there is a little slower than light. So let's assume uh, right outside the event horizon you have 299. You run any faster, the cops will stop you. Okay, so you got 299. But this particle is able to beat that because it travels at 300,000 kilometers per second. What can it be? It's got to be a photon. It's got to be light. So we're no longer are we talking about particles and antiparticles like, you know, the positron and the electron. We're not talking about that because those don't travel at 300,000 kilometers per second. It's only the photon or maybe a tachyon which, tra which travels faster than light, okay? Or the anti-tachyon, who knows, you know, they, <laughs> they've got all these particles. Um, so I just want you to understand that, what's happening here. The reason you have Hawking radiation is that this particle beats the speed of gravity outside the event horizon. Okay? Important. The, the speed of gravity, only re uh, 300,000 kilometers per second, only reaches up to the event horizon. Anything after that is a little slower. Okay? So the farther away you are from the black hole, you travel slower. But remember, the influence of a black hole reaches light years to a star that is very distant from it. Okay? And so it has that influence, but this little particle, you know, can escape that influence, supposedly because it's traveling faster than the speed of gravity outside the event horizon. Okay? That's, that's the explanation they have. Okay, what is the problem with that? Well, um, uh, here, here's one of the problems with it. Uh, this is how they uh, illustrate the black hole, okay? And what are we saying here? We're saying here that, um, that you have a black hole, okay? And uh, you have particles falling in there, okay? I think you can see that. You have these marbles, and they fall into the gulf hole. Okay, that, that's essentially what they're describing there. Okay, and the first question is why don't the fall, uh, particles fall upwards? Remember that in general relativity, and this is a general relativity rule or law or theory, uh, there is no force. So you don't have anything called gravitational force in general relativity. They have field equations, not force equations. And uh, so the first issue is why would they fall downwards? Well, the only reason they always illustrated downwards and the uh, depression in the canvas going downwards or in the fishnet is because, you know, we're all accustomed to things falling downwards and we can all understand that. But if they show you this, you, you might have questions. And so they don't show you something like this because it's counterintuitive. Okay? But let's concede, okay, so the uh, particles fall down the hole, like here. That could shown well, in a minute here, a second. Particles fall down the hole, okay? We can all understand that. Uh, think of uh, if you play golf, okay, there you got it, okay? Okay, so, uh, so what's the story? Well, uh, we have a little problem here because what um, uh, Hawking is saying that you have this situation where you have particles coming out of the hole because the speed limit right outside the black hole is not 300,000 kilometers per second. In other words, 300,000 kilometers per second only applies to inside the black hole up to from the bottom point there to the event horizon, which is the mouth of that hole. 
and next to it you have 299, 298, 297, and everything down to zero, I guess, right? So as you move away from the black hole, the speed limit decreases. And what he's saying is because of that, the balls can roll out of the event, right outside the event horizon, and then travel all the way to your eyes. And the question then again you have to think here is why do those balls travel outwards when you have such a massive object such as a black hole is alleged to be? Why don't they also fall inside the black hole? Why would anything, I mean do you think you would fall inside the black hole if you were outside the event horizon? Do you think you could escape if, if, if there's a, you know, th think of um, you're in a river, uh, maybe uh, in some kind of, um, uh, Cascade or Falls. You should have seen the one I've seen, uh, the one in, um, uh, uh, the one that's between the three countries, Brazil, Paraguay, and Argentina. And you go there to the um, uh, Iguazu Falls. And it's interesting because it's just what I would like to illustrate here. You see a, what is called the Garganta do Diablo, the, uh, the uh, throat of the devil, okay? And you look in there and it's, um, it's like, uh, you know, when you flush your toilet, just like that. It just uh, goes around and if you fall in there, well, you're gone. You go to the center of the earth. And, um, and that's what uh, we have here. We have uh, a particle that's trying to escape that. Imagine, imagine you were in a waterfall and falling into this garganta do diablo, you know, the throat of the devil, a, a toilet that's just drawing you in, right, because it's got this, not only, not only does it have the gravitational pull by magic, by whatever, but it's got the gravitational pull, but on top of that, it's going around, it's like swirling, and here you're at the edge of this monster swallowing you, do you think you could swim out of there? And this is what these people are saying for the particle. The, they're saying that the particle is able to escape that whole process and just, you know, drift easily away and come to your eyes here on Earth. And so it's very counterintuitive what they're saying. It might make sense to them mathematically, but under no circumstance does it make sense physically. Okay? Totally, total nonsense what they're proposing. Okay, uh, is that where the nonsense from the black hole stops? No, here we have uh, a little more. Um, first thing I want to note here is what these people are saying. They're saying that, um, uh, you know, Chandra Sekhar got his uh, Nobel Prize for claiming, okay, claiming that um, a, a uh, black hole can, uh, uh, whittle, can shrink down to zero size. And that's important to keep in mind that, you know, the original paper said, look, this thing, which is m many times more massive than our sun, can compress, compress, compress gravitationally until you end up with a zero-dimensional singularity at its center. At the center of what? Well, we don't know. Uh, apparently at the center of nothing, all they have is a region of influence known as the uh, event horizon. Okay, so this is, this is what... Uh, um, Hawking writes in his book, A Brief History of Time, he says that essentially nobody could believe that a star could collapse to zero size, in other words, lose all its structure, and uh, that's what Chandrasekhar proved, and that's what he got his Nobel Prize for, essentially, okay? Okay, so for all his work on black holes, but primarily because he could show that matters crushed out of existence, what is left is a singularity, okay? And, uh, yeah, and that's exactly what we see today. Uh, here you have, um, first, the definitions. Okay, first you have the definition of what mass is, and there's several of them. Uh, it's important to keep those definitions in mind because that's what you're taught in high school and in college. Uh, mass, how much matter there is in something. Matter is anything you can touch physically. Okay, fine. Uh, the quantity of matter contained in an object. That comes from uh, Eric Weinstein's World of Physics. I mean, these are official sites, okay? Uh, if you look for an answer, well, you'll find them there. And then at the bottom there you say, in scientific context, mass is the amount of matter in an object. And uh, again, that's out of the Wikipedia. So you have all these sources and they all tell you that mass is the quantity of matter or a measure of the quantity of matter. Okay, And um, 
there you have uh, the definition of mass and uh, you'll, uh, from the Wikipedia and it shows that there are at least seven different definitions. In physical science, one may distinguish conceptually between at least seven different aspects of mass or seven physical notions that involve the concept of mass. Okay, whatever mass is, uh, apparently uh, the, the most popular one is the quantity of matter. What do they say in the center there? Well, we have Cole Miller, a professor at University of Maryland, and David Harrison, another professor of University of Toronto, and they say a black hole crushes all matter out of existence, and that takes us to the circular argument on the right. If a black hole is made of mass, and mass is the quantity of matter, and a black hole crushes all matter out of existence, we have absolutely nothing in front of us. Okay, so that's the main uh, argument, I guess, against the black hole. And just in case uh, you thought that was the end of it, well, here we have Mr. John Wheeler and Edwin Taylor. They wrote in their space-time physics, nature does not offer us any concept as the amount of matter. History has struck down every proposal to define such a term, even if we could count number of atoms or by any other accounting method try to evaluate amount of matter, that number would not equal mass. Okay, so we don't have a definition of mass today. Nobody knows what mass is. Everybody uses the word. Uh, we use it to uh, weigh down the canvas of space and we use it to move things around uh, light years away, uh, this runaway mass known as a black hole, but nobody has defined the word mass. Nobody knows what it means. The, the notion that everybody has is the quantity of matter, but it turns out a black hole crushes all matter out of existence. So we have nothing. <laughs> So far, we have absolutely nothing, okay? Keep that in mind. We, we got nothing, okay? That's, that's what these people are working on. They're just numbers and equations tell you they've proven it. And they don't know what they're talking about. Okay, uh, and here we have NASA versus, um, um, what is it, Max Planck Institute in Germany, and they have two different versions of what a black hole is. It's important to see these because uh, we've got the two-dimensional black hole versus the three-dimensional black hole. Uh, on the three-dimensional side, we have NASA, and they say black hole, a great amount of matter packed into a very small area, and you'll see the word small, the word sphere. Uh, these are all different uh, representations uh, that you'll find on their site. You'll sit, they'll talk about an object. They'll talk about city size. So we're talking about something greater than zeros, greater, uh, diameter greater than zero, radius greater than zero. Okay. On the other side, we have uh, the Max Planck Institute, and they say black hole is not a tangible object, but a region in space. Well, obviously, a region is not the same thing as a standalone ball. Okay. And, you know, um, uh, here you have uh, a situation where you have uh, the one in the center there, for example, you see a ball inside uh, a region. The region is that the big... Um, a balloon or the big sphere that en encapsulates the ball and the ball has at the I don't know if you can see it a little dot a white dot and that's the zero dimensional singularity at its center okay this more or less makes a little bit of sense uh, if we just have the um, singularity and the region of influence with no object there no because it's been crushed out of existence uh, then uh, it's harder to believe you know, uh, it's harder to understand what a black hole is. But if there's a ball, okay, we can say, okay, there's a massive ball in the, uh, in the center of that whole sphere. And the sphere really is a region of influence of the mass of that object. You know, the Earth, for example, has a gravitational influence all the way to the moon. So we can understand that more or less, okay? And the white dot would be the center of the Earth more or less, assuming the Earth were a perfect sphere. We can all understand that. But what we can't understand, the one on the right, uh, the concept hole. And that's just a hole in space-time. They're telling you that the object, the standalone object, which used to be a sun, suddenly became an opening, a zero-dimensional opening, by the way, uh, into space or space-time. And now they're talking about a hole and not about a ball. So, you know, you have the, this dichotomy in, in the literature where uh, these people use both concepts, uh, both notions of a black hole. On the one hand, they'll talk about the black ball, you know, crunch up to a certain diameter, and then it stays there, and now this thing has lots of mass, okay? We can all more or less relate to that. And then you have the uh, opening in space or space-time, which is a hole, and that hole allegedly, you know, takes you off to another universe or a wormhole. 
In this case, the gravitational attraction is towards the center, like here on Earth, you know. You're pulled towards the center of the Earth. The Chinese guy on the other side of the planet, or the Indian guy, you know, they're pulled towards the center of the Earth in the opposite direction. So we're pulled, uh, our feet are being pulled towards the center of the planet, okay? Unless you're a flat earther, then you got a different theory, okay? But I mean, the, the standard theory is we have a ball, uh, the Earth, uh, it's a sphere, not a perfect sphere, but let's assume it is. The guy on one side of the planet is uh, being pulled feet first towards the center, and the other guy on the other side of the planet is also pulled feet first. So we're all pulled towards the center. Now, if we go to the center, are we going to end up in another universe or a wormhole? You know, so it's a different story to say that you've got a hole in space or space-time to say that, you know, a black hole is a ball. We, we, these are two different notions. They're irreconcilable notions. Okay? And of course, what they use is a little bit of surrealism. What they say is, yeah, you fall towards the center of the singularity, but that singularity is like, you know, it takes you to the fourth dimension and you go through a tunnel, through a dimension you can't see or can't feel or whatever. And so, you know, at that point, they're just talking total nonsense. They're talking stuff that, you know, that uh, they claim exists out there because they can show it mathematically, but they cannot represent it physically, they cannot make an image of it, and so the question is, what are they talking about? If they cannot represent what they have in their head, and they can't put it out here for you to see with your eyes, no, they say, you got to go to university, study math, then you'll understand it. Sounds like brainwashing to me, <laughs> okay? Okay, so um, uh, here I have uh, uh, just another notion, just to drive home the point, that a region is not an object. You can you can encapsulate a region of a um, of a fish tank, a globular uh, or spherical region, and that spherical region, no matter how you turn or twist it, is not the same thing as a ball. Uh, a region is always of something else. Yeah, I can pull that balloon from the water and say, look, this is a ball. And yeah, that is a ball because you have it in your hand. It's a standalone object. I can bring it to the conference. What I cannot bring to the conference is a region. See, if you're going to talk about region, you're talking about a region of something else, a volume of something else, or within a volume within a volume. That's what you're talking about when you talk about a region. That's not the same thing as a standalone ball. And I had trouble uh, uh, getting uh, JFG to, to understand that concept. We didn't have enough time to debate it, and he didn't want to go into it. But that's an important uh, point because uh, these people talk about region, and people say, well, a region is a ball. A ball is a region. No, they're not. A region is a concept, and it's a dependent uh, uh, concept. In other words, it's, it's of something else. Okay, It's not a standalone thing. Okay, uh, just in case, here you have NASA and uh, they have their wormhole. You can see that, yes, uh, uh, you know, they, they've turned these things into, uh, what is it, uh, uh, science fiction, really more like science fantasy. They have the black hole, which is not zero dimensional, as you can see there. It's a big opening, you, you know, you can, end, you know, uh, um, an elephant can enter through there, and not only is the black hole also uh, not only two-dimensional, but you can see that the wormhole through which you could travel uh, is also greater than one dimension. You know that looks two dim the whole thing looks two-dimensional. In fact, it looks a three-dimensional drawing in two dimensions. There's nothing that's zero or one-dimensional in that whole picture. Okay, and you know, so, so these people can't illustrate what they're talking about. That illustration does not match what the mathematics tells them, which is zero dimension and one dimensional. It has nothing to do with what they're, you know, illustrating here. And again, that's why, that's why they say, well, this is just an analogy and you shouldn't be attacking the analogy, you should attack the math. No, because we need an explanation of how the universe works, the real universe. And if they don't have an explanation, then mathematics is not the language of physics. It's just that simple. Uh, also, you'll see Mr. Brian Greene, you know, he, he uh, allegedly says that this is science. He jumps into a wormhole, okay, in his documentary on space and etc. And he shakes hands with himself in the morning. Uh, few hours earlier or seconds or minutes earlier. So the question is whether this has anything to do with science anymore. This is, this is just nonsense that is um, great for the eyes, you know, for people who want to go in there and say, 
oh, uh, I like fantasy, I'd like to travel with my mind. Yeah, that's fine, but don't call it documentary. Don't tell me this is science. Don't tell me this is the consequence of mathematics, which is an objective criteria or objective uh, method of reaching truth of how the universe works. Now, this is absolute nonsense. We should finger it as nonsense and say, look, don't put this as a documentary. You want to make a little uh, uh, Hollywood movie with flashy scenes and, you know, special effects, fine, but don't call it science. These people are saying this is science. And the people out there who are not familiar with all these things, oh, how nice, you know, I, I saw them go through a wormhole. You know, and it, it's just uh, nonsense they're feeding the, the public. N wormholes are nonsense. We, we don't care what these people do with their equations. We want, we want the, the real thing out here. And if you say that your equations say this, that's what we're going to criticize the images that you put in there, not your equation. We don't care about your equations. It's the other way around. See, they want us to go and fight their equations. No way. I'm going to fight their interpretation of their equations. That's what I'm challenging. Okay? It's the nonsense that they feed the public. Okay, uh, we have Mr. David Blair tells us how, how, uh, how it is that they arrived at wormholes. Yeah, he says space is a physical object. He says a very tangible material with tangible properties like stiffness and shape. And he ends up saying that, you know, uh, the most important thing to keep in mind about Einstein's universe is that the fantastic stiffness of space, of the rubber sheet, if you like. The stiffness of solid steel is about 10 to 11. Space has a magnitude of about 10 to the 43rd. And space is a billion, billion, billion times stiffer than steel. Okay? Now, this is a professor from the university who's saying this, okay? And he, he's, uh, as you can see, he's got a lot of titles, a lot of uh, gold medals, the Olympics that he won. And... Uh, and he pushed their authority around saying, look, uh, I got a PhD and look at all my medals and, you know, and, and they tell you that, you know, space is stiffer than steel. And that's how they can drill a wormhole through it. Okay, let's see if we can move on here. Um, well, let me skip a couple things so we can go a little faster here. Uh, what is it we have to show? What is it the astronomers look out, um, see out there that we have to explain? Well, one of the things we have to explain is this guy here. It's uh, claiming that it's the first uh, star that we saw moving around nothing. Uh, Cygnus X1, okay? And uh, Cygnus X1, by the way, is the... Um, is the black hole there, the invisible black hole that they put in by hand. They said, look, if that star is going around there, HDE226868, I think it was. And uh, this star goes around nothing, and you have to explain that. How do you explain it? Well, they artificially put a black hole in the center of that orbit. Okay, so that's one of the things they observe, and they say, we can't explain it. It's got to be a black hole. And then they move on to the second part of that, and that's to explain it, to, to um, uh, put mass in there. You know, and they say, how much mass would it take to move a star of that magnitude around? And they calculate the mass, and they say, oh, yeah, that can only be a black hole. That's how they come up with these things. Another phenomenon we have to explain, and by the way, these are real phenomena, okay? You still have to explain them. And that's that, suppose the, uh, there's gas out there, uh, typically from the skin of a star, and it's swallowed into nowhere, okay? So it just vanishes into absolutely nothing. And they say, well, what could it be? Well, it's got to be a black hole that's sucking all this uh, gas in. And then, they, you know, a lot of people out there tell you, well, black holes don't suck. And they tell you it doesn't suck, but then they show you it's sucking gas from distant star into the black hole. So whether, whether the gas falls into the black hole or it's sucked in there, it doesn't matter what wording you use. The point is that a black hole is apparently uh, sweeping or vacuuming this gas into the black hole. Okay? And so they see something like this where gas disappears into nothingness, and we somewhat have to explain that. Okay? Okay, so, uh, so what's the story? Um, how do we explain this? Well, uh, for this, you, you need to know what light is under the rope model, okay? And so here, let's start with that. Uh, the rope model says light consists of a rope. In other words, the mediator of light is a rope. The rope torques, 
and what you receive in your eye is a thump on your um, on the atom that's at the, at the other end of that rope. So when I shine a light at you, all I'm doing is increasing the frequency, the speed at which the atom that is connected to that rope is pumping. Uh, the extra pumping forces the uh, goosebumps there, the little uh, links, to be shorter and um, and uh, so there's more of them. So we have higher frequency, lower wavelength. And that higher frequency reaches your eye in the way of a thump, that it, it compels the atom in your eye to pump faster as well. And that is relayed from atom to atom. That's why uh, not only is light pretty much instantaneous here on Earth, uh, you know, in our short distances, but um, um, it, it spreads out immediately. It, it can go around corners and so on because of this, because all atoms are relaying the, the signal, okay, the, um, the torsion. So that's light. Uh, how do we come up with this? Well, um, here's the atom. Okay. Here's the atom. Um, the atom consists of uh, these ropes that are approaching the surface of the atom. Okay, the magnetic thread, arbitrarily using the same word by convention, magnetic and electric. Magnetic thread curls around and encapsulates the electric thread, which goes straight across. Okay, so the electric thread from every atom in the universe uh, forms a little star in the center, and all the magnetic threads from every atom in the universe uh, encapsulate and form a, 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 we could call it a um, ball of yarn. Okay, so it's a, a corrugated or somewhat uh, rough surface uh, at a very fine, uh, you know, if you had God's eyes and could go in there, uh, you would probably see a um, rough surface. Okay, and uh, this little thing uh, pumps back and forth, and by pumping back and forth uh, according to the quantum jump, it torques the rope. That's the model that I'm proposing. Am I asking you to believe this? No. Um, not here to prove anything, not here to convince you of anything. I'm here to give you a model that you can use to explain what I'm going to explain today, which is black hole phenomena. Okay? And uh, again, uh, well, I'm just going to give you a different version. You take it for what it's worth to you. That's all I can say. Okay, so, um, so here, just in comparison, here's the quantum atom. Okay, you're probably familiar with it. And uh, the big problem, these are from the internet. I put the green uh, medium or colored it green there. And the green part is the, the critical part. We need to know what keeps the electron bound to the proton. And unless you can explain or tell me what that green stuff is, you don't have a theory. You can't even start your theory. And they've used all these words, fabric, space, field, canvas, you know, false vacuum, virtual particles. You know, they, they gave it all these names. The, none of them are valid things. We need a physical object. What is that green stuff? And we need to know how it works. In other words, you have to show the mechanism of how the proton keeps the electron from flying away spontaneously. Okay. And uh, here's another version of it. Um, see if I can find it. Here's the dynamic version of the quantum atom, just for comparison. Okay. Here it is. And again, what we need to do is in the first one on the left and the last one on the lower right, we need to explain what the black stuff is. And on the upper one on the right, you need to explain what the yellow stuff is. Okay. That's what, that's the million dollar question. What is that yellow stuff? What is the black stuff? We need to know that because we need to know how, why those electrons don't fly away. By the way, in the first case there, uh, the uh, figure eight there, that's the uh, P orbital, whereas the other ones are the S orbitals. Uh, if you studied a little bit of chemistry, uh, you probably know what I'm talking about. But the point here is that um, you get to explain how those electrons uh, are kept in their orbits, why they don't fly away, okay? So, you know, the fact that uh, quantum says, well, you know, we don't know where the electron is at any point in time and blah, blah, blah. And we need Schrodinger's equation to determine the shape of the S and P orbitals. Fine. All that's great. Uh, we don't care about any of that. Uh, we just want to know what what is the mechanism that keeps the electron bead from flying away. And unless you can explain that, you can't even start your presentation. OK, 
Okay, so this, this is the issue, okay? And they skip that, you know, they said, we don't know what it looks like. You, know, you don't have to know, you don't have to run an experiment. You just have to think and tell me what is your model. That's what you have to tell me. You have to bring a model. And if you're gonna bring a model of a little bead going around, you know, a proton ball, your model had better have an explanation for why that electron doesn't fly away. That's the issue, okay? And that's what they'll never explain to you, no professor will tell you, okay? Okay, uh, so where do we go from here? Um, well, I showed you light. Here's electricity and uh, magnetic field, okay, under the rope model. And what we have here is a row of aligned, I put them as aligned atoms. You gotta really think of these as molecules, but let's look at them as atoms just for the sake of simplicity uh, for the explanation. And the row spins, and you can see the uh, electricity is going into your eyes. Okay, whereas the magnetic field goes exactly at 90 degrees to it because that's the direction in which the row of um, atoms, in this case, right, is spinning. So it's very simple. One is at 90 degrees to the other because there is no other possibility uh, if the uh, magnetic field is made of threads. Okay, so again, this is a model uh, for you to understand a different universe that I'm uh, illustrating for you. Okay. And um, here's the magnetic attraction. This is how we produce attraction and repulsion uh, in the, um, in the, under the rope model. And what you have there, whether you turn the magnet around, as long as you have north facing south, okay? And what you have is threads, okay? These are threads, physical threads, by the way. They're physical threads, but very thin, very, um, you know, something unimaginably thin, okay? And when they clash like that, that pushes uh, them away. And here, in, the, in this case, you can see that the two top halves of the magnets are going clockwise. And it's the same here, okay? They're going clockwise. And when one comes up, it latches onto the other one coming down. In the bottom half, they do exactly the same thing, but in the opposite direction, okay? And here you have clashing. You have clockwise against counterclockwise. And that's what south against south or north against north is okay so uh why am i bringing this up well i'm bringing this up because i'm going to explain gravitational phenomena not with mass as they do in mathematical physics i'm going to explain it with magnetism i'm saying it's a magnetic phenomenon what's the magnet Whoa, what am i talking about what's the magnetic field it's the magnetic field of the galaxy what is a magnetic field? A magnetic field is made out of sweeping threads, countless sweeping threads. These threads move around and they move around atoms, okay? And magnetic fields of, uh, uh, for example, the sun extends all the way to the bow shock. And uh, for those who don't know what a bow shock is, it's the region where the solar system or the magnetic field of the solar system, this encapsulating uh, shadow, okay, uh, meets interstellar space, okay? So we live in, a, a, um, our solar system is a little bit of a cocoon, okay? It's a cocoon. It's got all these sweeping threads, that's gonna be the magnetic field, and this magnetic field extends way beyond Pluto. And, you know, our sun in comparison to this uh, distance is a, is a dot. It's this little dot that's got this mag enormous magnetic field reaching all the way to the bow shock, uh, which is very far away from Pluto, you know, away from the sun from Pluto, right? And a magnetic field of a galaxy also extends enormously, you know, far, okay? And uh, that's what I'm gonna use. I'm gonna use the magnetic field of uh, the, the uh, galaxy, okay? And where do I have it? Uh, somewhere in here. See if I got it. Um, let me find it here. Okay, let's start here. Here you can see uh, how a little ball, this is on Earth. Uh, if you have a charged ball, it'll move in circles or in a spiral manner in a magnetic field. Now think of that little ball as a, as a star, as a sun, okay? And think of the magnetic field as the magnetic field of the galaxy, okay? So it's sweeping down, and you can also move a star around nothing, 
not because there's a, a big mass in the center of that whole circle or of that orbit, but because there's a magnetic field flowing down upon it. So we can produce the same effect. We can do it here on Earth. We can surely, God can do it out there and uh, in, in, uh, at the galactic level, okay? And uh, here you see it uh, illustrated. Um, where is it? Uh, here it is. Here you see it illustrated at the galactic level. You have the galactic magnetic field, which are threads that are moving all around the magnetic field. And I think that magnetic field should be much uh, greater than what I show there. Uh, probably three times as much, at least, I would say. And on the bottom uh, right, you'll see what I showed you a minute ago, which is a little uh, a ball, charged ball, going around. If we take that to be a sun, a star, uh, we can see what, uh, you'll see that little white ball there moving around. And that, what I'm trying to illustrate there is that the magnetic field of the galaxy is sweeping down on that little ball and compelling it to go around, just like we would see here on Earth. We don't need any mass to explain black holes. That's the point. The point is that under the rope model, we can explain this, and we do explain this with magnetic field of the galaxy. Uh, just in case, um, we had that smoke, uh, that uh, gas that was being sucked by a black hole, and we also have an explanation for that uh, under the rope model. Let's see if I can find it here. Uh, this is what we see here on Earth. Let me make that a little bigger. And uh, what you see is that um, that little round thing that at the bottom, uh, that's a uh, rotating magnetic field. You can see it's sucking the gas, which is, in this case, uh, smoke. Uh, smoke is made out of particles. Uh, depending on how fine it is, you can even call it molecules. And the smoke is being drawn into that rotating magnetic field. And you can see there's no black hole, there's no big mass. All we did here is have a rotating magnetic field, which is invisible. You can't see it, but <laughs> uh, th this was done with uh, electricity, okay? It's uh, an electrical, mag electromagnetic phenomenon, what you're seeing here. It's done completely with, magnet with a magnetic field. And you can see how it's swallowing the gas, okay? or in this case, uh, the smoke. And what I'm saying is that's what happens also uh, at the galactic level. And here you see it at the galactic level. Again, on the lower right-hand corner, you'll see what I just showed you, the uh, smoke going into the rotating magnetic field. And that's what I'm saying that the galactic field does as well. So if you're pointing your telescope and you see gases coming out of a star and going into nowhere, just disappearing into thin air, I guess we could call it, or into space, well, uh, you shouldn't be... Uh, thinking about spirits or you don't, and you don't even have to think about mass all you have to think about is that uh, the galactic magnetic field is powerful enough to be able to uh, uh, rip the gaseous skin out of a star and uh, and just you know take it into nothingness it just swallows the gas so um, again we don't need mass to explain any of this uh, assuming we could define mass, assuming we could say that mass weighs down space-time, which is another discussion. But even conceding all that, you don't need mass. You don't need mass. You can do this with uh, magnetism, with an electrical, electric, electromagnetic phenomenon. In other words, you can, a mechanism. You, you can do this with, with magnetism. And under the rope model, uh, these are physical threads. They're very thin, uh, unimaginably thin, okay? That's what a magnetic field is. It consists of all these moving threads. And again, I like to show always this, uh, this GIF, which is uh, really important to see because people are not aware. They think that a magnetic field is something static. And um, here, here you'll see that it's not the case. Uh, so I'll close with this, and here you'll see it. Here's a magnet underwater, and you can see it's drawing each of the, um, uh, what is it, uh, the um, iron filings one by one towards it, okay? So a, a magnetic field consists of something that is in motion, okay? 
And that's what I'm saying is happening uh, with the magnetic field of the galaxy. It just sweeps around the entire galaxy. And if there is a star, uh, especially a highly charged star, maybe a major star, big star, which has lots of magnetism, yeah, the magnetic field of the galaxy could toy around with it like, you know, the bead at the end of your car antenna. You know, you move it around and that little bead goes like that. I think the magnetic field of the galaxy would do the same thing to a charged star. And all stars have a magnetic field. So uh, we have uh, a magnetic field being affected by another magnetic field. Okay, folks, uh, I'm going to continue with a little bit of this. I'm going to, I think I have my closing arguments for next time around. And then we'll resume with the ether and the infinity and uh, space and the, the nature of space okay and we'll do that next time as well hopefully i'll get to be able to do both uh, closing arguments and the uh, continue with the uh, ether subject that we've been doing for now a little over a month we'll see you then bye bye